Although rare encounters with marine life highlight the ocean's unpredictable and dangerous nature, do we truly grasp the risks of venturing into their world? From sudden shark attacks to close calls with deadly creatures, these incidents remind us of the wild, untamed realm beneath the waves. As humans delve deeper, whether for work, exploration, or leisure, are we prepared for the delicate balance between survival and danger? Here are six stories. It was a cool morning in 2002, close to the sleepy fishing village of Hermanus on South Africa's untamed southern coast. The sea, which had long sustained the town's people, stretches out and shimmers in the meager autumn light. For generations, fishermen had been leaving this location, navigating the Atlantic Ocean currents, lowering their nets, and retrieving their catches. The Sea Spirit, which the crew boarded, was owned by Anders Viljoen. Four dependable sailors had sailed with Anders for nearly 40 years. The day began like any other, the boat rocking gently as the crew prepared their gear. While Hermanus was known for whale watching, these fishermen ventured out for the rich shoals of fish that provided their livelihood. Anders stood beside his grizzled first mate, Peter de Klerk, at the helm as the others did their tasks. Siswe Mokwena, in charge of the nets, was present with two younger deckhands who had joined the crew a few years prior, Gert and Don. About 12 nautical miles offshore, the crew headed toward one of their regular fishing locations, a location known as the Deep Blue. Having had a successful season thus far, the men were in high spirits, and the sea was calm. However, as the hours went by and the nets revealed that they were lighter than anticipated, a feeling of unease spread across the boat. When the sun began to set in the mid-afternoon, Gert looked over his shoulder for indications of fish when he noticed something unusual in the water. It was first just a large, slowly moving dark shape beneath the waves. The crew was soon looking over the side of the boat, watching the strange mass lurking below after he called out to the others. At first, Siswe dismissed it as he had witnessed numerous odd occurrences in the water over the years. Though something about the shape seemed off, he muttered to himself, probably a whale. It was too large to be anything else that came to mind, and it wasn't moving like a whale. The shadow was enormous, with a length almost equal to the boat itself. Peter, ever the cautious one, advised them to avoid it. But Anders took a closer look because he was curious and maybe a little too bold for his good. The water churned as they approached the dark mass, which he approached slowly with the sea spirit. The crew was left speechless as they observed the shadow come closer to the surface and reveal itself as a shark, a great white no less, rather than a whale. It was not what they had ever seen before. They had never seen a shark as large as this one in all their years at sea. It was terrifying due to its sheer size. Its bulk was even more intimidating, with the dorsal fin standing taller than any crew member. What made it worse was its behavior. This shark was aggressive around boats in contrast to the generally cautious, almost indifferent attitude they displayed. The shark started to circle the sea spirit with quick and purposeful movements. Its nose bumped the boat, resulting in a violent rocking of the vessel. The crew realized how predatory the shark was and they scrambled, eyes wide with terror. That was hunting, not just curiosity. Anxiety arrived. But as the shark kept circling unabated, Anders's composure began to crumble, and he yelled commands. The men seized fishing poles, hooks, and other weapons-like objects to repel the beast. But the creature seemed unaffected by anything. The crew feared the worst, thinking the shark might capsize them as its massive body sent shudders through the hull every time it bumped the boat. Gert and Don, the younger brothers, were especially shaken up. They clung to the rigging for support, their faces pale. Ever the practical, Peter reached for the ship's radio and made a distress call. He was shaking when he told the Coast Guard about their predicament and the shark's size and aggression. A shark acting so hostilely toward a boat was unprecedented. As the minutes dragged on, the shark's attacks grew bolder. It started slamming the boat hard, its jaws snapping perilously near the edge of the craft. It once cracked the skin exposing rows of sharp teeth and icy black eyes. The crew felt a chill upon seeing it. Their voices could hardly be heard over the roar of the breaking waves and the boats creaking as they shook from the onslaught. They screamed in terror. Although backup was en route, the crew was still determining if they could survive long enough for assistance. Their experience with the shark's behavior was unmatched. 
it appeared unrelenting, as if propelled by an invisible force. A state of desperation emerged. The shark approached Sizwe, holding a harpoon, and attempted to jab at it, but the animal was too swift and powerful. With a forceful flick of its tail, the shark almost swept Gert overboard, sending a wave smashing over the deck. Don grabbed his brother in time to save him as the water receded. After an eternity, the Coast Guard finally showed up with their larger reinforced vessel slicing through the waves toward the Sea Spirit. Equipped with more advanced equipment, they successfully drove the shark away. However, it required multiple tries and a few precise blows with a specialized harpoon gun before the animal finally withdrew. The crew breathed a sigh of relief as the enormous Great White vanished into the depths. Despite having made it through, the encounter shook them. After escorting the Sea Spirit back to shore, the Coast Guard gave the men shock treatments and debriefings. The news soon reached Hermanus, and specialists were called to investigate the shark's peculiar behavior. What they found was concerning. Due to the overfishing in the area, the shark's natural food sources had been reduced, which made it more aggressive in its hunt for food. Furthermore, Bigger predators have been drawn closer to the coast due to habitat disruption brought on by rising tourism and pollution, increasing the frequency of shark-human interactions. The experience made Anders Viljoen and his crew acutely aware of how precarious the equilibrium between nature and humanity had become. Weeks later, they were back in the water, but the memory of the enormous shark never left them. The Australian coastal city of Cairns provided the base of operations for a large-scale scientific project in the spring of 1993. Known for its vivid coral and marine life, the Great Barrier Reef was also home to one of the ocean's most misunderstood predators, the bull shark. Although many marine biologists worldwide have studied the area for a long time, few have dared to dive into the dangerous world of night diving to witness sharks' nocturnal behavior. That was until the eminent but quiet marine biologist Dr. Emily Carter changed that. Dr. Carter, a Marine Science Institute researcher, had always been fascinated by the enigmatic nighttime antics of sharks, especially the bull shark, which was notorious for its erratic behavior. Her studies concentrated on the behavior of these sharks after dusk, when there were usually fewer people in the water. To learn more about their hunting habits and territorial instincts, it was intended to collect previously unheard of footage and data. With over 10 years of experience studying marine life, Emily, who was in her mid-30s, was an unparalleled authority on shark behavior. Her last dive would be this night dive, even though she had previously led dozens of successful dives. The seafloor dropped off the reef's edge and into the depths just past where the dive occurred. It was known for its shark population and beauty with bioluminescent plankton lighting up the water like stars in the night sky. The group had made considerable preparations, arming themselves with emergency supplies, reinforced wetsuits, and cutting-edge underwater cameras. A surface crew in a small research vessel called the Marlin was always on call to step in if something went wrong, and every dive was carefully planned. Dr. Two other divers accompanied Carter, a seasoned diver in his late twenties named Bryce Navarro, who served as her assistant, and Leif Stroud, a technician in charge of monitoring the underwater camera systems. Both men had accompanied Emily on multiple expeditions, and despite their cautions, they had complete faith in her abilities. Casting a pale glow on the coral below, the group dove into the dark depths, their lights piercing through the muck. The water was strangely still. The crew noticed that as they approached the 30-meter mark, the vivid hues of the reef vanished into the darkness, leaving only the steady clicks of their oxygen tanks and the sporadic distant hum of a boat engine above. With her eyes searching the waters for any indication of movement, Emily's mind was concentrated. Soon after, something sizable moved in the distance, catching her camera's attention. The shark was a bull, enormously large, the shark's eyes reflected the lights from their cameras as it moved through the water easily, its blunt snout and stocky build. Emily's heart raced with excitement instead of fear. She had been hoping for a close-up photo shoot of a nocturnal predator and now had it. She signaled her team to let them know the shark was nearby. She took her time getting closer. The shark initially swam in a lazy arc around the divers, seemingly unaffected by their presence. 
It was apparent to Emily not to hurry. Bull sharks were known for acting aggressively toward one another, particularly at night when their senses were more acute. Without notice, they could become hostile. Something changed as she brought her camera focused on the shark. As it started to circle faster and tighter, the creature's body language changed, showing more erratic movements and a sharp tail flick. The realization that she had crossed some invisible boundary caused Emily's eyes to enlarge. The shark had changed from being interested to becoming assertive. The bull shark leaped in an instant. The shark's teeth locked onto Emily's leg, causing an excruciating searing pain. A shockwave raced through her body from the bite force. Her vision became blurry, and the water turned murky due to the blood. She kicked out of instinct, attempting to break free. But the shark locked her in its hold. After spotting the unexpected attack, Bryce and Leaf, who had been a few meters away, ran to her defense. Signaling the surface team of the situation, Bryce slammed his hand on the emergency beacon attached to his suit. Meanwhile, Leif tried to frighten the shark away by grabbing a sharp dive knife and slashing at the water. The shark eventually freed Emily after what seemed like an eternity, and vanished as swiftly as it appeared. Emily was bleeding heavily and was now seriously hurt. Her leg was a twisted mess and she was barely conscious. She was fastened to Bryce and Leif's dive line, and they started the painfully slow ascent. As they battled to save her life, every second seemed like an hour, and they were constantly watching the water for any indication that the shark would return. The crew had already hurried to work on the surface. The marlin was underway before Bryce and Leif broke the surface, as the emergency beacon had set off alarms. Emily had not responded by the time they reached the top. As they hurried back to shore, the crew hauled her onto the deck and started CPR right away. When the paramedics arrived at the dock, it was already too late to save her. Doctor, upon her arrival at Cairns Hospital, Emily Carter was declared deceased. Blood loss from the severe trauma to her leg was the official cause of death. The team had tried their hardest to stop the bleeding in time, but the attack had severed an artery. Within the scientific community, the incident caused a stir. Respected researcher Emily was killed and her passing served as a sobering reminder of the risks that marine biologists must always take. Her tragic demise brought to light the unpredictable nature of these apex predators, even though the risk of shark attacks was statistically low. In response, the regional authorities and academic institutions promptly instituted fresh safety guidelines for night dives. These included more emergency preparedness training, the requirement to use shark deterrent devices, and harsher rules regarding the proximity of known shark habitats. Emily's co-workers used the media following the tragedy to stress the value of comprehending sharks rather than stigmatizing them. Her studies had always focused on coexistence rather than fear. As calls for improved protections for sharks and those who study them increased, shark conservation efforts gained traction. Although Dr. Carter passed away, her legacy endured because of the work she had devoted her life to. Years later, the reef where Emily had made her last dive was marked with a memorial plaque. It honored Dr. Emily Carter, who sacrificed everything to gain knowledge in her quest to unravel the mysteries of the deep. Her experience served as a lesson for other researchers, showing them that no matter how experienced they were, they could never fully control the ocean. In the summer of 2005, it happened in Santa Cruz, California a beach town renowned for its beautiful coastline and lively surf culture. Thousands of visitors and locals flock to the Santa Cruz Beach Festival, which features live music, food trucks, surf competitions, and water sports every year. That particular day's weather was ideal, with bright blue skies, a gentle breeze, and the sun beaming off the Pacific. While many people had a happy and celebratory day, some would never forget the nightmare that unfolded that day. For many years, Santa Cruz has been a well-known beach resort. The town, whose history dates back many years, was formerly home to many fishermen but now prospers from tourism. The sea has always been a source of mystery and life for the people there. Due to the seals and sea lions that frequent the kelp forests nearby, great white sharks were known to live in these waters. Despite the sporadic sightings, shark attacks were uncommon and most locals and tourists had grown accustomed to the ocean as a playground rather than a wilderness. That year's festival was incredibly crowded, drawing an estimated 10,000 people to the beach. The O'Connell family, 
Mark, a general contractor in the area, his wife Teresa, and their two teenage sons, Derek and Lucas, were among the attendees. Another person there was Kira Vance, a nearby San Jose college student who had come with her pals to enjoy the sun and possibly try paddleboarding. Although nobody could have foreseen the danger gradually approaching, a lifeguard team led by seasoned surf lifesaver Brad Buzz Garrison carefully watched the waters alongside them. As the afternoon wore on, a subtle shift started to show in the ocean. The people on the beach were unaware that a 14-foot great white shark had been lured nearer the coast. The normally tranquil waters had been disturbed by increased human activity and food waste thrown into the water during the festival. Although the warning signs were mostly ignored due to the festival noise and excitement, a few lifeguards noticed unusual behavior among the local seabirds. Things drastically changed in the evening. A local fisherman, Victor Polanski, saw the dark shadow moving beneath the surface while casting lines from a small nearby pier. He initially believed it to be a dolphin or a sizable school of fish, but the water revealed its distinct dorsal fin as it got closer. Victor's heart fell short. However, it was already too late when he finally radioed a warning to the lifeguards. A group of swimmers enjoyed the cool water in the shallows about 50 yards offshore. Among them were Kira Vance and her pals Derek and Lucas O'Donnell. They were unaware that danger was hiding under their feet. Before Kira could react, the water surrounding her turned red, signaling the first sign of trouble. She felt something brush against her leg. Swiftly striking a friend of Kira's who was bodyboarding, the shark's attack was swift. The attack's brutality and suddenness brought on an explosion of panic. The easygoing vibe of the festival was abruptly destroyed by screams that pierced the atmosphere. As they watched the horrifying scene play out, onlookers froze, some paralyzed with fear, and others running toward the shore in a last-ditch effort to escape the water. Buzz Garrison, a lifeguard tower nearby, heard the disturbance and quickly alerted the other guards with a whistle blow. Scurrying towards the water, he seized his rescue board. Troy Klein and Jesse Malone, two additional lifeguards, followed closely behind him. They knew how precious time was and how quickly the shark could strike again. The shark had vanished as soon as it appeared and the water remained tainted when the lifeguards arrived. While Jesse and Troy assisted in guiding the swimmers still swimming back to the shore, Buzz helped Kira's injured friend onto his board. As everyone rushed to exit the water, tripping over beach chairs and towels hastily, the beach descended into chaos. Festival organizers attempted to restore order as parents cried out for their children, but the damage had already been done. Emergency personnel arrived in minutes, and the wounded were taken directly to the hospital. Regretfully, one of the victims passed away from their wounds before they could be stabilized, meaning they did not survive the attack. Before long, word of the shark attack at the Santa Cruz Beach Festival was circulating throughout the state. The town was in disbelief after that. Although shaken, the O'Connell family was relieved that Derek and Lucas had escaped unscathed. After witnessing her friends suffering in the water, Kira Vance battled survivor's guilt. Following the incident, numerous requests were made to local officials for improved shark activity monitoring, which raised major concerns about beach safety. A team of marine biologists, including Dr. Felicia Cortez of the Monterey Bay Aqua Park, was brought in to evaluate the situation. She explained that the shark was probably drawn closer to shore than it would have normally ventured, because of the increased human activity and food waste. However, she warned against demonizing the creature, reminding people that sharks instinctively respond to their surroundings. The town council called multiple emergency sessions over the next few days to discuss avoiding another disaster. Others, like Dr. Cortez, pushed for stronger waste management regulations and improved public education about marine life. Some called for increased shark hunting to lower the local population. The council ultimately decided to enact additional safety measures, such as better lifeguard training for shark-related emergencies and the placement of shark detection buoys along the coastline. The attack deeply scarred Santa Cruz, and many people would never feel completely safe going to the beach again. But it also brought conservation efforts back into the public eye. Dr. Cortez collaborated extensively with neighborhood institutions and groups to spread awareness of shark's value to the marine environment. 
Eventually, the community struck a new equilibrium between tourism and environmental conservation. The O'Connell family and Kira Vance would never forget that day. Previously a place of happiness and leisure, the beach had become a sobering reminder of how fleeting life can be. However, they also understood that the locals had banded together in its wake to defend the town's residents and its ocean, demonstrating Santa Cruz's tenacity. Isla Mirada, a tiny seaside community tucked away in the Florida Keys, was a hive of activity in the summer of 2004. Anglers worldwide had flocked to the yearly high-stakes fishing tournament, eager to show off their skills in the pristine Atlantic waters. With a grand prize that had the potential to alter someone's life, the competition had gained prominence over time. As participants readied themselves to venture into the shark-populated waters, boats lined the marina, each outfitted with cutting-edge fishing equipment. Isla Mirada was once called the sport fishing capital of the world because of the abundance of marine life in its waters. The town's ecology has begun to shift in recent years, though. Overfishing and rising ocean temperatures caused by climate change have upset the delicate balance of the marine environment. Residents began to report seeing more sharks, especially the more aggressive species like bull and tiger sharks, and the large predators that had previously stayed farther offshore started moving closer to shore. However, these reports had caused little concern, and the competition continued for decades. On the first day of the competition, excitement was in the air as the sun rose. Tom Reynolds was one of the competitors. Tom, an experienced angler from the Midwest, traveled to Florida hoping to catch the fish to win the tournament. Since he had participated in previous competitions, Tom was no stranger to the ocean, however. There was an extra element of risk this time because, although most anglers would rather deny it, the growing number of sharks made them wary. Throughout the first part of the day, nothing went wrong. As anglers were hauling in trophy fish, the leaderboard began to take shape. Although Tom had already caught several impressive fish on his boat, the Marlins chase, they needed to be bigger to take first place. He steered his boat farther away from the crowded fishing spots and into deeper waters in an attempt to take the lead, a move that would soon prove disastrous. Almost instantly after tossing his line into the deep blue, Tom felt a strong tug. His rod buckled from the sheer force of what was a huge catch. Tom skillfully worked to exhaust the creature at the other end of the line for the next few minutes by wrestling with it. This started the battle between man and fish. As the fish approached the surface, his heart raced because he could see the shimmering scales of what looked like a massive grouper. Perhaps it was this fish that took home the grand prize. However, there was an abrupt, strong disturbance in the water as Tom started to reel in his catch. A large dorsal fin broke the surface and in an instant, a massive tiger shark appeared. It circled the boat with alarming speed and aggression, drawn by the struggling fish on Tom's line. The shark's aggressive behavior was frightening compared to its usual behavior. Before Tom could react, the shark sprang at the catch, driving its razor-sharp teeth into the fish and causing it to flail wildly. Tom struggled to keep his balance as the boat shook due to the shark's powerful attack. He released the line, hoping the shark would become disinterested, but it didn't. Rather than attacking the boat directly, the predator ambushed it from below. Panic struck as the impact sent Tom sprawling onto the deck. The shark's unrelenting attack was unmatched by anything Tom had ever witnessed. It circled once more, but this time it shot partially out of the water and struck the boat side with incredible force. Tom reached for the radio to call for help, but the shark struck again before he could contact the competition's headquarters. This time the boat was violently shaken as its strong jaws clamped down on the side. Water started to seep into the boat's hull as one of the stabilizers cracked from the pressure. Tom realized he was in big trouble, and after witnessing the attack, a few other competitors in adjacent boats promptly radioed for help. Rescue boats were sent out, and the competition was stopped immediately. But by the time assistance came, the harm had already been done. Tom's ship slowly started sinking because it was absorbing too much water. The rescue crew saved Tom, but the shark circled the wreckage as though defending its domain. The terrifying event had a ripple effect throughout the competition. The tiger shark's aggressiveness alarmed many fishermen, and rumors of more shark sightings started. 
While some participants had seen sharks acting strangely near the coast, none had experienced anything as violent as Tom's. Almost immediately after the incident, an investigation was started. Environmental specialists and marine biologists were consulted to evaluate the circumstances. The overfishing in the area reduced the sharks' natural food sources, drawing them nearer to human activities. Their findings revealed a troubling trend. Further changing shark migratory patterns have brought them closer to fishermen due to rising sea temperatures. These elements working together had produced an ideal storm of hostility. The Fish and Wildlife Conservation Authorities strengthened the area's fishing laws following the attack. More shark population monitoring was done, and new regulations restricted offshore anglers' travel limits during contests. The town of Isla Morada also launched initiatives to inform tourists and fishermen about shark behavior and ways to avoid risky encounters. The event permanently scarred Tom Reynolds. Despite surviving the attack, he decided to give up competitive fishing. The excitement of the activity was now overshadowed by the memory of looking into the eyes of a predator that almost killed him. However, his tale warned others, showing them that nature could retaliate violently when pushed to the brink. It was 2009 and fishing vessels found the North Atlantic waters more dangerous. One of the area's biggest vessels, the Atlantic Seeker, was the reputable commercial fishing company Blue Wavy Fishing. The captain of this ship, Laura Mitchell, was an experienced seafarer with over 20 years of experience in these harsh waters. The vessel was well known for its size and efficiency. Its main goal was to harvest large amounts of in-demand swordfish and tuna, but recently it had to contend with an unanticipated and dangerous threat, a persistent pod of mako sharks. As the autumn winds started to stir up the already turbulent Atlantic, the Atlantic Seeker sailed out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. The group, which included experienced fishermen like Arlo Fenton, a burly first mate, and a quick-witted engineer named Isaac Weiler, had encountered many difficulties while sailing the open ocean. But they were still determining how serious the shark issue they would deal with would be. Sharks had historically been a problem on occasion, attracted to the smell of blood and bait when the crew brought in their catch. But something about this pod of mako sharks was different. They were far more aggressive and unrelenting than the crew had ever seen. The sharks ate the leftover fish, actively attacked the nets, broke equipment and, most alarming, circled the boat for hours after the fishing had ceased. The crew's annoyance increased after three weeks on the journey. Before the valuable catch could even be loaded aboard, the sharks tore into their nets, reducing the size of their hauls. Constant repairs resulted in low morale. The engineer, Isaac, mumbled that the Makos appeared almost synchronized as though they were picking up tricks on the boat. The crew now jokingly referred to them as the wolf pack, but the humor did little to hide the underlying fear. And then the storm hit. A sudden gust blew across the North Atlantic on a chilly October night. The Atlantic seeker rolled erratically in the churning sea as the waves rose suddenly. With her hand steady on the wheel and her eyes searching the horizon, Captain Laura Mitchell stayed on the bridge as the storm tore apart. She had survived storms in the past, but this one was different. Sharks, in addition to the storm, made the sea feel alive beneath her. The smell of fish and the churning waters sent the Makos into a frenzy, and they launched a full-scale attack on the vessel. The crew faced an even more terrifying foe, as they struggled to gather supplies and prepare for the storm. The sleek bodies of the sharks struck the boat with a startling force as they started to ram the hull. Arlo, the first mate, was nearly thrown overboard as one particularly aggressive shark attacked the lower deck, snapping its powerful jaws at anything that moved. In the chaos, crew members were injured. One man, a deckhand named Joss, was knocked unconscious when a wave hurled him against a railing. Another junior fisherman named Kellen suffered a deep gash in his leg after slipping and falling onto a broken piece of equipment. The situation was spiraling out of control. With the storm showing no signs of relenting and the sharks continuing their assault, Captain Mitchell knew they had to act fast. She ordered the crew to pull in the remaining lines and nets, but the sharks had already done significant damage. Half of the night's catch was lost, shredded by the Makos and the boat's starboard netting had been torn apart. Battling the elements and the sharks from below deck, Isaac worked tirelessly to keep the engines running, 
but even he knew they were pushing the Atlantic Seeker to its limits. The crew, beaten and tired, entered the ship and secured the deck. They huddled together for hours while the storm raged outside, constantly reminded of the danger beneath the waves by the sound of sharks biting into the hull. Hoping for a break in the storm and hoping the boat would hold until morning, Captain Mitchell remained on the bridge, her gaze fixed intently on the radar. The storm had passed by dawn, but the damage was inflicted. With its hull smashed, gear scattered, and crew messy, the Atlantic Seeker hobbled toward Halifax. Thankfully, there were no fatalities. Even though several of the men, including Joss and Kellen, were taken to the hospital upon arrival. As the storm passed, the sharks vanished, apparently weary of their onslaught. Following this, blue wavy fishing had to make a difficult choice. The crew had been put in danger, and the constant shark attacks had severely impacted the company's earnings. The board of the company and Captain Laura Mitchell agreed that a change was necessary. It was made evident by the incident that the conventional techniques were no longer viable, and that industrial fishing carries significant risks in areas where sharks are prevalent. Weeks after the event, Blue Wavy Fishing implemented new safety measures. The company invested in reinforced shark-resistant nets and installed new sonar systems to detect large predators before they could approach the vessel. They also adopted more sustainable fishing practices designed to minimize the amount of bycatch that had likely been attracting the sharks in the first place. Captain Mitchell, though outwardly stoic, was deeply impacted by the experience. For her, the ordeal was a stark reminder that the ocean, while bountiful, was also unpredictable and dangerous. The sharks had been a force of nature doing what they were meant to do. And if blue wavy fishing wanted to continue operating in those waters, they had to respect that balance. Though the Atlantic Seeker eventually returned to the North Atlantic, it did so with a renewed sense of caution and responsibility. Captain Laura Mitchell continued to lead the crew, who no longer viewed the sharks as simple nuisances, but rather as an intricate and sometimes dangerous part of the ecosystem in which they had chosen to work. In 2006, Makapu, one of the most well-liked but dangerous beaches on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, was bathed in a sun that set over its immaculate sands. Makapu attracted surfers worldwide who were keen to test its formidable waves because of its reputation for having strong rip currents. However, the waters supported species, and few people dared to consider them below the surface. Although reef sharks are a normal part of the ecosystem, their presence has increased sightings in recent years, which has alarmed lifeguards and beachgoers alike. Over his 10 years as a lifeguard, Jake Thompson logged many hours patrolling the shores of Makapu. Jake was well known in the neighborhood for his steadfast commitment to beach safety. He was tall, athletic, and composed under all circumstances. His vigilant nature saved numerous lives, earning him the respect of surfers and fellow lifeguards. Jake was an experienced sailor, but he had never encountered anything like what would happen that fateful afternoon. When the sun was at its highest and the beach was most crowded at noon, Jake saw a surfer struggling far out in the water. Jake observed the telltale signs of someone caught in a rip current from the tower as the surfer board bobbled heavily in the rolling waves. He scrambled into the water, slicing through the surf with practiced efficiency, and grabbed his rescue board without hesitation. Jake could see the fear in Max Harrington's eyes as he paddled closer to the troubled surfer. Max is a young man in his early 20s. Max had been dragged far from the coast's safety, and trying to swim back had only made him feel more exhausted. Before things got worse, Jake realized he had to take swift action. There was a giant reef shark nearby, but Jake and Max did not realize it at the time because of the disturbance in the water. Six feet long, the shark had been hunting fish in the deeper waters just past the break. However, the shark's interest had been aroused by Max's frantic attempts to escape the current as evidenced by his splashing. It began to circle, moving closer and closer to the two figures in the water. As Jake reached Max, he gave him clear instructions on how to stay calm and hold on to the rescue board. However, Jake noticed a shadow moving quickly beneath the surface, and he started to pull them both toward the shore. His heart raced as the shark's silhouette came into full view, its sleek body cutting through the water like a torpedo. Jake put himself between Max and the shark without thinking twice. 
Though nothing had completely prepared him for this particular situation, his training had taught him how to handle encounters with marine life. Though he was aware that sharks seldom attack people on purpose, given how unpredictable the scenario was, there wasn't much margin for error. During the shark's initial pass, Jake could observe its icy dark eyes as it swam near them. Feeling a rush of adrenaline, he used his rescue board to form a barrier and pushed the board in the direction of the shark, hoping to scare it away. Even after the shark turned away, it remained. Jake sensed the tension in the water, the spontaneous energy of a predator evaluating its target. The shark circled for several drawn-out minutes. Jake used all his strength to hold onto the rescue board and keep his body between Max and the shark while making eye contact. Though remaining motionless was also out of the question, he knew that abrupt movements might incite an attack. It was a risky dance that could go wrong at any time. The shark abruptly changed its direction. With terrifying speed, it lunged toward Jake, its jaws snapping open. Jake instinctively shoved the board forward, but the shark's powerful body slammed into him, its sharp teeth grazing his right leg. Pain shot through Jake's body as he felt the sting of the bite, but he didn't let go of the board. Jake thought this was it for a split second as the blood mixed with the salt water. It was terrifying. However, the shark retreated, possibly frightened by the opposition. It made a turbulence-filled wake as it swam off into the deeper waters. Although the threat had subsided, Jake still faced difficulties. He was starting to lose strength and his leg was bleeding profusely. After realizing the situation's seriousness, Max grasped the board and did his best to assist Jake. Jake led the two of them back toward the shore, where other lifeguards had already noticed the disturbance with sheer determination. They dove into the water, saving Jake and Max. Although Jake's leg was promptly bandaged, it was evident that he had suffered a significant injury. Jake was quickly taken to the closest hospital by ambulance after one arrived. Jake's brave deeds caused word of them to travel fast around the island. Though wounded, he had prevented a potentially fatal shark attack and preserved Max's life. His courage was a focal point for the neighborhood, igniting discussions about beach safety and the need for more effective shark monitoring programs. With marine biologists, local authorities started implementing new safety measures, such as increased monitoring of shark activity and educational initiatives to encourage coexistence between people and sharks. Although Jake Thompson took a while to heal, the scars on his leg were a constant reminder of the day he survived a shark attack. His deeds prevented a fatality and altered public opinion regarding the precarious equilibrium between marine preservation and ocean recreation. The episode represented resiliency for all those who lived near the Makapu waters, not just for Jake, 